want who has been around um, is to a degree alarming. Sometimes I feel like he, he's on a reality show. It's like he's uh, doing the apprentice or something. You know, he's just putting on an act. We'll have a lot more of that tape, and Steve Bannon is here tonight to react with some pretty strong words. Also, two former NFL greats are here for a big debate after another controversial weekend on the NFL football field. The vice president of the United States, Mike Pence, he left the Colts 49ers game after players continue to disrespect the flag, the anthem, and of course our military. Also tonight, Republican House Majority Whip. Steve Scalise, remember he was the victim of that shooting, he will respond to the left's call for gun control after the Vegas shooting. And tonight we have two major announcements, big ones you don't want to miss. But first, tonight's important breaking news, opening monologue. Right this weekend, more and more disturbing accusations emerged about Hollywood executive and major, major Democratic donor Harvey Weinstein. Now, after mounting allegations of sexual harassment, Weinstein was actually fired by his own company. That's good news. Now, while details of what Weinstein is accused of doing are beyond shocking, what is even more disturbing is the fact that for 30 years, this guy has been praised by the left, by liberals, by Hollywood and Democrats. Now, let me explain. The website, Voktivim, they analyzed almost 1,400 Academy Awards acceptance speeches. Harvey Weinstein ranked second for the most thanked person. Now, back in 2012, Meryl Streep even jokingly called Weinstein God, and she is one of only just a handful of celebrities that are now speaking out against Weinstein in the face of these accusations. But where's the widespread outrage, condemnation from Hollywood? I thought they cared about women's rights. Now, if the tables were turned, and this was a conservative, in the same situation, Hollywood liberals would be enraged, the media would be enraged. However, since it's one of their own, it's mostly crickets. The silence is deafening. Another example of how Hollywood has ignored this scandal, according to Axios. Look at this. All these late night comedians, Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, Seth Meyers, James Corden. Guess what? They didn't mention it at all during their shows. In Saturday Night Live, the show that ruthlessly mocks President Trump and all conservatives, well, they had jokes written about Weinstein, yet they never made air. And what's worse is that the SNL creator, Lorne Michaels, he tells the Daily Mail that the reason he didn't go after Weinstein is because it's, quote, a New York thing. Really? Well, Michaels really meant it's a hypocrisy thing. And you can't forget about attorney, Lisa Bloom. Pretty much any time a woman accuses a conservative of something, she swoops in to represent them with a major press conference to attack conservatives. Big surprise, Bloom was actually advising Weinstein before resigning this weekend. And Bloom made the announcement via Twitter, Twitter, not Twitter, quote, I have resigned as an attorney and advisor for Harvey Weinstein. My understanding is that Mr. Weinstein and his board are moving forward and toward an agreement. What does that even mean? Now, you would think since Bloom is the so-called champion of women's rights that she would never, ever consider working for Weinstein. Her hypocrisy is stunning, but it's not surprising. Now, the same goes for many Democrats. They took piles of money from Harvey Weinstein, and only now, after these allegations surfaced, some just a few, not all of them, are beginning to give it back or give it a charity. Look at these statistics. Weinstein donated an estimated $44,000 to Hillary Clinton since 1999, and that's on top of the 15 grand he shelled out to a super PAC tied to Clinton. Weinstein also contributed over $56,000 to the Obama Victory Fund. The Hollywood Big Shot, he gave over $97,000 to the Democratic National Committee, and he also wrote checks for over $76,000 dollars for the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. All told, the Center for Responsive Politics calculates Weinstein contributed over two million dollars to Democrats. That's only since the year 2000. Now, some Democrats, they're giving some of the money back or they're donating it to other liberal causes. They think that cleans their hands. But again, no across the board outrage, no disgust. And we can't forget that the two biggest beneficiaries of Weinstein's contributions Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, they have yet to comment publicly about him. If it was a conservative, you think they might have commented? This is what I was telling you about during the election. Liberals claim to care the most about women's rights. If they did, 
Hillary Clinton and her family foundation would never have taken money from countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Oman, Kuwait, the UAE. Now, these countries treat women horribly. They kill gays and lesbians, many of them. They persecute Christians and Jews. You can't build a temple or a church in Saudi Arabia. So the left, this is selective moral outrage. They're completely full of it on every single issue that they lecture you that they're morally superior about over Republicans. For example, the Daily Caller reporting that there's a coffee shop owner in Seattle, Washington. We have the videotape of a group of Christian anti-abortion activists get kicked out after a vile tirade, all because the owner couldn't tolerate their presence. Watch this. There's nothing else you can say. So, this is you. so we're not welcome I here. I do not want these you, people in this place. So you're not willing this to tolerate our presence? Extremely offensive. Can you right. tolerate my presence? We are. Right, right. we're actually oh, in really? your coffee shop. Really? Okay, if I go get my boyfriend right now, in the right here, you're going to tolerate that? That would be your choice. Are you going to tolerate it? Oh, it's your place. Answer my question. No, you're going to sit right here and watch it. Well, no, I mean, we don't want to well, watch then that. I don't have to tolerate this. Well, you that's true. Do. I mean, you then don't. Then leave. Yeah. All of you. Yeah, Tell all your friends don't come here. Oh. Yeah, I like I'm not going to be saved by anything. I Christ in that okay? He's not. Yeah, he Can't hear it. He's talking about anal sex with Jesus Christ just to offend people. Have you heard anything about this story in the mainstream, left-wing, destroy Trump media? Probably not. You probably didn't even see the tape until right now. And guess what? You probably never will. And here's why. The left, they say they care about religious liberty, especially when it comes to Christians in this country. Well, guess what? Why do I believe if this was another religion, do I suspect there would be widespread outrage, lawsuits, the left would be apoplectic, the media would be covering it 24-7, 365. But in this case, they're Christians. Doesn't seem to matter to them. And then there's this example that the Washington Free Beacon is reporting on. You have a group of students trying to shut down an exam at Berkeley because of the stress that they are enduring and claiming racism. Watch this. Instead of an exam, we are requesting a take-home essay with significant time to prepare. Our well-beings are being put on the line because of our emotional, mental, and physical stress that this university is compounding with what is already going on in our everyday lives. We demand that you make and hold space for center to, to center the voices of students of color. Are you trying to silence us right now? Is that what you're trying to do? We're going to let the students take the exam. We can walk outside and I can, can continue the conversation. I think we're going to head away with that because it's our next and there's a phone right now. Uh, you are more than welcome to do that. I don't know why you feel like sitting down, you know. I don't understand. I really don't understand. You can take a test, but people are dying out there. We now have reach it, reached a point of cultural insanity. The left claims they're all for free speech, but look what happens at the so-called home of freedom of speech. And we also cannot forget that conservatives have pretty much been essentially blocked from speaking at UC Berkeley. The left doesn't care about this country's history, doesn't care about its culture. Just look at these videos from earlier today. All the Columbus Day protests. Liberals, they have no problem supporting people, defacing, vandalizing our history and statues. You know what? What about what other people think? What about tolerance? It's just like what we saw when leftists were tearing down and removing Confederate monuments. Here it goes even further. Now, the one thing the left does not seem to care about is the NFL. NFL, when they disrespect our flag, our country, and the thousands and thousands of Americans that fought, bled, and died fighting under that flag and protesting. They're out there protesting the national anthem. This weekend, the vice president, Mike Pence, he walked out of yesterday's NFL game following national anthem protests. The vice president and the second lady, Karen Pence, attended the game in Indianapolis. And after a handful of 49ers, well, refused to honor the flag, Pence and his wife rightly headed for the exits. The vice president later tweeted, quote, I left today's Colts game because at POTUS and I will not dignify any event that disrespects our soldiers, our flag, or our national anthem. We have a big debate later in the program. And President Trump took to Twitter writing, quote, I asked Vice President Pence to leave the stadium if players kneeled, disrespecting our country. I am proud of him and Second Lady Karen.
Good for the vice president taking a stand. Americans are sick and tired of seeing these players protesting the flag and not honoring those brave men and women that fought, bled, and died. And by the way, this is a country that gives them an opportunity to make millions of dollars playing a game. NFL owners, they're beginning to start to realize that millions are at stake here and the American people are fed up for what is now blatantly disrespectful behavior. Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, he said yesterday that players who protest the national anthem, they're not going to play. And the Miami Dolphins owner, Stephen Ross, he's saying it is incumbent on players to stand and salute the flag of the United States. Finally, it's about time these owners did something because as Mark Thiessen pointed out a couple of weeks ago, the NFL's game operation manual says all players must be on the sideline for the national anthem. They must stand at attention, face the flag, hold their helmets in their left hand, and refrain from talking or face discipline, such as fines, suspensions, and or forfeiture of draft choices, first offense. But by the way, you can't do this in the end zone, or you can't twerk, or you can't be offensive to the other team, or you can't gloat in the end zone. A lot of rules restricting freedom of speech. You can't put 9-11 will never forget on your cleats. And you can't honor police officers slain in Dallas. Now, of course, after the vice president left the NFL game, the left, the liberal mainstream media, went into full-on freakout mode. ESPN's Jamil Hill, remember her? She's the liberal host who tweeted that President Trump was a white supremacist. Well, earlier tonight, Hill was suspended by ESPN for two weeks after calling for fans to boycott advertisers of the Dallas Cowboys. You know, it's interesting how she got suspended for that, not for attacking the president of the United States. Here's the bottom line tonight. This country is divided culturally because the left is hypocritical and inconsistent. They only feign phony moral outrage, but only when it suits their political agenda. They only care about, they're only outraged over conservative scandals, not liberal ones. And they pretend to have the moral authority on issues like race, women's rights, gay rights, and the list goes on and on. The truth is this. The left has been lying about all of that for a long time. And this Harvey Weinstein scandal proves all of it. For the right price, the left and their silence can be bought. Joining us now with more on this, the author of a brand new book just out today, Billionaire at the Barricades, The Populist Revolution from Reagan to Trump, in bookstores now, host of the soon-to-be upcoming show at 10 p.m., following this show every night, a rare in-studio appearance. Hey, How are you? Good. What's up, Miss Ingram? It's good you're to see you. You're going to be uh, throwing to me at 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to be throwing Where's the... that football? Can you, ca can you catch? Oh, hello. I can throw better than you can. <laughs> yeah, throw it to Ray Arroyo. Yeah, uh, great. He got, dropped it. He dropped it. Well, uh, it was a, it was a surprise victory. Uh, I I am tired every two and four years. Yeah. Conservative, racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic. It's a, it's a lie, and they get away with the lie. Yeah, the Weinstein thing is a, is it's, it's a big deal. Uh, I'd heard rumors about this back in 1999. Friends of mine who worked in the modeling industry and worked in the entertainment. Yeah, industry. I have all my friends in the modeling well, industry. Well, you know, they're friends that you'd hang out with in your construction uh, days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they, they mentioned some things about Weinstein. I didn't really know who he was, but it sounded pretty gross. But this is part of the reason why so many working class Americans have tuned out to the so-called experts on the left in politics because they claim that whether it's Sandra Fluke who comes around, along and says well there's a war on women out there it's being waged by Republicans no one takes them seriously uh, does, you don't take them seriously when Michelle Malkin or, or other conservative women are attacked on college campuses. They never speak out to defend them. You've been they, shouted down. Oh, I've, yeah, it's a, we all yeah, have. Whatever. We, it's, it's, we're now just used to it. But it's one thing if you're really for women, who, whatever they believe. But they're not. They're only for you if you ascribe to a certain set of viewpoints. But isn't it if, if Hillary takes money from Weinstein and is silent throughout this whole process? Where's Michelle Obama? Has she spoken out yet? No. I might have missed well, it. Well, they've taken did. money from him, too. Just like in the campaign, I couldn't yeah. believe that there was no outrage over the millions and millions that she took from countries where men yeah, tell women how to dress, to death, killing drive. gays and lesbians. Yeah, but again, th there is no moral certitude when it comes to the, uh, the left because they are about conglomerating more power in Washington, 
that keeping the big international institutions afloat and depriving the deplorables uh, of power to run their own lives. That's the whole point. They, they don't trust the voters. These people don't trust the regular work-a-day Americans to make decisions for their own lives. They think Washington should make those decisions. So if you believe in the, whatever, the climate change agenda, the abortion agenda, re reformulating the family, whatever their uh, issue of the day is, if you stand with them, they'll go, they'll, they'll defend you to but the there's end something wrong. until they're shamed into I don't uh, like being lied about yeah. because guess what? Yeah. I love women. I'm not the caricature that they paint. Right. You know, for all these years, they got one playbook. It's every election. Yeah, well, and, it's the and war then on women, the, the war, on, war on immigrants, Trump is a protect. Remember a year ago, I was looking back yeah. on this because you and I were on the air. A year ago, they were saying that if Trump got elected, that the global economy would tank because he's going to be a protectionist and an isolationist, that the U.S. markets would collapse. On election night, you had people on other cable channels warning people and saying, sell, sell, oh, our, sell. Our obituary, our obituary. Oh, they had already written that. Remember, they had already remember written the night that before well. the election, Sean, I, we were sitting here? You, I was reading your book, and this is fascinating to me. I've always been a Reagan conservative. Yep. You know, tell me one part of Trump's agenda, maybe trade would be one, that's not what Reagan did to get the economy going. Well, I didn't, I didn't say on trade, Sean. Remember, Reagan saved Harley-Davidson by laying import taxes on cheap Japanese motorcycles. And George W. Bush saw the populist uh, approach in, in taxing it with imports of cold, rolled, cheap steel coming from China and Asia. So, you know, Obama did a little tariff. Uh, Trump uh, wants to do more tariffs. Bush saw the wisdom of that. And the Republican Party has been a, quote, protectionist party. That's true. But guess what they're protecting? American, American jobs, manufacturing. workers. So Trump taps into that understanding, that mentality. A year ago, well, we just want like, fair trade. Yeah, he, well, we, no, trade is great, but it's it, trade isn't a theory that we debate at the American Enterprise Institute on a Saturday afternoon. That's not tra trade is something that we believe in because it betters the life of the average American. Well, you, That's what Trump I'm understood. That's what the this. elites don't. With with Steve Bannon, who's up after you, and and it's amazing to me these Corker tapes. Yeah. The level of he goes right to the New York Times. Notice it. it that that tells you he exactly where he's coming. didn't know these tapes were going to be released. He goes you can right hear to it. the New York Times. I, I, I think I think Cork, Corker Sean is a Bush Republican. He's a, you don't meet him. He's a nice guy, but he's always been squirrely about Trump. I ran into I him. I'm going to tell uh, tell the Fox yeah. viewers something that I didn't write in the book. All right, it was go too ahead. Late. I ran into Bob Corker at an airport about I think it was April or May of 2016. I guess it was May of 26, June, right after Trump was, was clearly going to be the nominee. And he was very uncomfortable with the idea of Trump as the nominee. He's like, well, and I said, you should talk to him. You should meet with Donald Trump. I think you'd actually, you'd see what, what, he's, what he's all about. It's about the regular person, the working people make this country great. He was great. begging to be Secretary of State. And he's like, climbing. no, I didn't, I didn't want, of course he did. He wanted to be Secretary of State. He thought that he might actually be the vice presidential pick. Yeah. All right. So you're going on a book tour, which is the reason why you can't be here for the next two weeks. OK, you know, give, give me you a know. break. I only write a book every four years. Yeah. unlike some All right. Other people. The book is phenomenal right there. Um, and you go to my website, your website, yep. and we you have the list and people are going to hear you speak. And Philly all that. on Thursday and by the night. way, in the back, I don't know what happened on that part. But what is that? You what? Know something he's been teasing me about this cover. That is me. <laughs> well, I like the, the front cover. Read Black Lives Matter. What? Blah, blah. You are bizarre. I'll be no. in Philly on Thursday. I've been Myrtle Beach on Friday, Oklahoma City Monday. We're Will you please sign time. a copy for me? Yeah, I guess. No, I, no I'm serious. I won't. All right. When we come back, Steve Bannon, he's going to weigh in on the issue of Bob Corker and those Republicans that are betraying the president and you. Also, two major announcements tonight as we continue. I don't wish him harm. Right. I don't. I, I, I just, uh, um, but I, yeah, I mean, just the, the volatility is, you know, to anyone who has been around, um, it's to a degree alarming, but again, I don't wish him harm. He's got people around him that have been able to keep him, generally speaking, in the middle of the road. Right. The tweets, um, especially as it relates to foreign policy issues, yeah. I know have been very damaging to us, yeah. okay? Yeah. And um, I do wish that would stop. Uh, but, you know, as evidence this morning, he just, uh, it's just something he has to do. Republican I want to that he's... Uh, uh, yeah, 
sometimes I feel like he's, he's on a reality show of some kind, you yeah. know, when he's talking about these big foreign policy issues. And, yeah. and you know, he, he doesn't realize that, you know, that we could be heading towards World War Three with yeah. the kind of comments that he's making. And it's like he, it, it's like it's an act to count, and I'm sure that bothers me. Republican Bob Corker slamming President Trump to the New York Times. Wasn't that nice of him? Meanwhile, Corker is set to retire at the end of his term, but former White House Chief of Staff, Chief Strategist Steve Bannon is now launching a new effort to target other anti-Trump Republicans with plans to back primary opponents to nearly every Republican up for re-election. Think Alabama, Roy Moore. He joins us now. He's the executive chairman of Breitbart News. How are you? You yeah, know, how are you doing? You 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 lost weight since you left the White House. You look good. Pounds. Oh, good for you. I feel great. He's so arrogant. He's such an elitist snob. He's the swamp. The Senate hasn't done a thing, Steve. Nothing. The American people see right here. This is the way. This is what they think about President Trump behind closed doors. He happened to tell the New York Times exactly what I thought. It's totally unacceptable. In a time of war, we have troops in Afghanistan, in the Northwest Pacific and Korea, we have a major problem that could be like World War I, in the South China Sea, in the Persian Gulf, we have American lives at risk every day. He tweets on Sunday that it's like the adult uh, center and somebody didn't have the morning shift, and then he has the audacity to go to the New York Times and to give this He type didn't know that was gonna air. He didn't know they were going to release that. I think, by the way, I, I'm not sure that he knew it was going to be a tape, but he gave those guys an on-the-record interview. You saw that in the New York Times. And by the way, Phil Rucker, yesterday in the Washington Post, the buried lead was, he said, there's only two or three senators on Capitol Hill that have President Trump's back. When you want to talk about why there's no repeal and replace, why there's no tax cut, why there's no tax reform, why there's no infrastructure bill, you saw it right there. Corker, McConnell, and Corker, and the entire clique, establishment globalist click on Capitol Hill have to go and if he needs any if he, we need any more proof about what they think you heard it tonight it's an absolute disgrace. I've been told by people in the room Ben Sass, John McCain, Lindsey Graham, uh, Corker and even McConnell they trash the president but yet they can't get any of their promises completed. I've they are the swamp Republicans are weak and pathetic and they're lacking in identity and the forgotten men and women that voted this election are being let down. Look, they, hold to they have total contempt for the forgotten man. They have total contempt for the base. That's what you saw in Alabama. In Alabama where they came in with uh, Luther Strange with $32 million to destroy Judge Moore, you saw at the base, thought of them, right? The base totally rejected them. them. These people have no respect for the working men and women in the United States. And I tell you what, Senator Corker is an absolute disgrace. And I agree with Jason Miller, who is the comms director on our campaign. I think one of the best comms people around. Jason's on CNN, but he never talks out of school. So sorry to hear that. He, well, on CNN Today, he called for Senator Corker to resign. I agree with him. For the governor of Tennessee to replace him with Marsha Blackburn, a real conservative. If Bob Corker has any honor, any decency, he should resign immediately. He should not let those words stand what he said about the he president of the United States. He wouldn't win, Steve. That's why he's by really by, getting by out. By the way, he got out because he saw what happened in Alabama. If, if he wants to, by the way, he should get back in because he's going to get crushed in Marshall a primary. Marshall Blackburn would kill he's him. He's going to get crushed in a primary. He doesn't have the guts to get in. So he doesn't have the guts to get back in the race. He should resign right, here's immediately. Here's a question. How does the president's agenda, if he's got hostile Republicans that are apparently willing to go on a suicide mission, if they don't get anything accomplished, they don't get the budget done, they, don't, they can't repeal and replace, they don't even want to fund the border wall. If they don't do those things, they're going to suffer in 2018. President Trump's not up till 2020. They have to understand. There's a basic agenda that President Trump ran on and won. He carried states that Republicans haven't, haven't carried in living memory. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. This agenda works. The American people voted for it. It's their responsibility. By the way, McConnell would not be majority leader unless Trump in North Carolina, in Missouri, in Wisconsin, was able to carry those senators across the finish line. It is incumbent upon them to back President Trump's plan, but you don't see it. What you saw what Corker said today is what they talk about in Capitol. That's when I left the White House. Remember, I said, I'm going after the Republican establishment, and we're going to go after him. We're going to challenge as a coalition. Give me the states. 
There's a coalition coming together that's going to challenge every Republican incumbent except for Ted Cruz, whether it's Utah, Wyoming, uh, whether it's uh, in, in Orrin Nevada, Hatch in Utah. Orrin Hatch in Utah. Today, Boyd Matheson, who is the chief of staff for, uh, for Mike Lee, came out and said that he's going to set up an exploratory committee. North it's Dakota. Hey, in North Dakota, we don't have it. That's uh, that's a uh, right. uh, But we're going. To, by the way, we're going in Mississippi against Wicker. Who you pick, McDaniel? McDaniel, Mississippi. These these names are all going to come out over the next couple of weeks. There's going to be about. So it's 15. not going to be. I know a lot of people didn't like in 2010, for example, uh, Delaware. Oh, I thought Christine O'Donnell was a nice woman. But you, you're picking the rock okay. solid credential We're candidates. We're spending a ton of time with the grassroots organizations to make sure that these candidates are fully vetted. You're going to see people announced this week that are going to have experience in government. You're going to see some outsiders that are authentic, and these people are real. It's not like 2010. 2010 was the beginning of the Tea Party when things were first getting going. You're going to see real candidates, and by the way, they're going to take on incumbents in every state, and they're going to take on the Democrats after that. You said that. in the 60 Minutes interview, you're a street fighter. I'm a street fighter, too. I'm I, no, I noticed that. Okay. You noticed that? I'm not supporting any Republican incumbent that hasn't gotten their job done. Not one, Steve. I refuse. They have betrayed the American people. Father. They have betrayed their promises. How do you make a promise for seven and a half years and not fulfill it? It's a lack of sense of urgency. By the way, these guys work three days a week. The American people now, people are working two jobs. Their wives are working two jobs. They know the urgency out there on the economic hate crimes that have been perpetuated on the American working men and this women, women in this country because of the trade deals. Is this a fair statement? Is Steve Bannon declaring war on the establishment that are not for the working men and women in this country? A hundred percent. We are declaring war on the Republican establishment that does not back the agenda that Donald Trump ran on and the President of the United States, and that is an agenda that we know backs the working men and so women in this country. This is a basically a war because you know what McConnell did war. in Alabama, I, and you know there are people out there. Look, I I've like had donors. Carl Rove I've had is going to put in all I, their money. Carl Rove, Stephen Law, these guys should get the joke. Their donors are coming to us because they're tired of having their money burned up by trying to destroy people like Judge Moore. It's a new game in town. We're going to cut off the oxygen to Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell's biggest uh, asset is the money. We're going to make it the biggest liability. We're question. going after these guys tooth and nail. Uh, does that mean that people that voted in 2010 and 2014 and 2016, now they have to wait to a victory in 2018? Listen, That's a long time for the American people to, to wait. To take your country back, it's not going to happen in just any one election. This is something you're going to have to grind out day in and day out for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. It took us a long time to get here. There's no magic wand we can wave and drain the swamp. There's no magic wand we can wave and, and blow up this establishment. I hate to tell people you're going to have to work, but you know what? The grit, determination, and courage of the American working men and women, we're going to win. I'm glad you're not going after Cruz. I've already endorsed him. Ted and I'll tell Cruz, you why. Ted Cruz is a good man. Ted Cruz has done, has one of the few that he stood there and said, we have the constitutional authority to not fund Obamacare, and his own party betrayed him. They're good men. I got to tell you, we are the, even safe incumbents like Barrasso and Deb Fisher. They have to understand something. Just voting is not good enough. You have to have a sense of urgency. Nobody's safe. We're coming after all of them, and we're going to win. Street fighter Steve Bannon. Good to see you. Thanks. Appreciate it. When we come back, two NFL greats are going to battle, debate the ongoing national anthem controversy. Also, we have two big announcements. And Steve Scalise is going to join us after he was shot, of course, in the baseball field in Washington, D.C. He wants to talk gun control. Straight ahead. And welcome back to Hannity. It was another controversial week for the NFL. Vice President Mike Pence, he walked out of the game between the Colts and the 49ers yesterday when several players took a knee during the national anthem yet again. Joining us now with reaction author of Liberalism or How to Turn Good Men into Whiners, Weenies and Wimps, former NFL great Burgess Owens and former NFL player Spencer Tillman, now part of the Fox family. Welcome aboard. Uh, it's great to have you, Spencer. Both of you are friends of Good. Mine. Spencer, let me start with you. Family of four goes to a game. Average cost for a family of four, about 100 bucks a ticket. <laughs> then the kids want jerseys, another 200 bucks. Then you get a, a beer, that's $400 a beer. And then a couple of hot dogs and popcorn. It's a $700, $800 day. Yeah. Most Americans are speaking loudly, and they're saying they want to honor their flag and their country and their anthem because men fought, bled, and died fighting yeah. under that flag. Players are not being responsive. 
And, you know, I kind of like what Robert Kraft said to all his players. I'll go and I'll match you dollar for dollar. Let's go in and help our community out. This is not going to end well for the NFL, Spencer. Well, it can end well for the NFL, and I think the NFL is in a perfect position to affect change. Uh, where all this crisis began with Colin Kaepernick last year in 2016 in the opening preseason game, when he kind of in a sullen way bowed in a manner was not respected of the flag. And he got together with a Navy SEAL, and they recommended that he kneel, uh, almost a universal sign of respect around the world. Understand that we live in a world of images and impression. Everybody does not have the same understanding of what it means. And for most of us, there is an in Inextricable connection between the flag, patriotism, and the brave men and women who fought. So it's very Hundreds difficult of thousands to separate died that. Fighting Absolutely. Under that flag. Absolutely. And, and we I know need you're a patriot. Look, that. It, it, look, you know, Colin Kaepernick, Burgess, here's a guy that donated to a killer's a cop killer's foundation. Had cops depicted as pigs on his socks. Here's a guy that praised a murdering thug and dictator, Fidel Castro. I'm sorry, if the NFL becomes the Kaepernick League then they're going to lose the, the men and women that want to go and be entertained and also honor their country. I don't think the NFL has much more time. Well, I, I guess the way I look at it, uh, I, I see the, the free market taking care of itself, and you're right, they're going to make a change. Uh, this, though, is the greatest opportunity that the president's given us, that we, he drew a, a red line, and we're now talking about true issues. And I think it's now time we talk about the root cause. Um, listen, guys, we have had a black caucus, we've had John Lewis, we've had Elijah Cummings, supposed leaders, and either they are totally incompetent or they're brilliantly competent in, in, in betrayal because they have actually done nothing for the black race. And as we talk about the misery that's happened through, my, through our race, these guys are silent every single way. 83% of black teen males unemployed, 70% of black men uh, leaving their family and, 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 and their, their babies. Um, we're down to the 3.8 percent of entrepreneurs versus 40 when I was growing up. No one's talking about it and has not talked about it for eight years you know, because these Marxists and socialists don't care listen, Sean, about the black Sean, guys. I've got to chime in on that, Sean. Everybody's talking about it in the African-American community. I think those statistics you just quoted, while true and important, it's a different context. It has very little to do, if anything, with what happened with Colin, Colin Kaepernick did and what we're discussing today. The issue right now is the NFL has a chance to nip this in the bud. Our vice president had a great opportunity. I respect his opinion, but if I'm going to make the trek to go see two teams, a combined record of uh, and two wins between the two of them at this juncture of the NFL That's season, not the point. Uh, I could pick, uh, wait, wait a minute, I'm going to tell you what okay, the okay, point okay, is, Tim, okay. but the point is this, if he goes to the locker room and spends some time and actually asks some of those players on the 49ers team, he doesn't the need to go to the locker room, all of this began, why not? The engagement is what because, the problem because, is, because we're not listening to one another. No, Sean, no, let me explain no, no, what the problem guys, is, I equate, it, I equate it to divorce. The person or yeah. the husband, just use an example of myself, that doesn't listen to the wife that tells him that she is not happy with the marriage or the relationship, totally bereft of the fact when he served papers, he's shocked and he's surprised that it happens. You must engage people to understand right, where they're at. My okay, dad gave okay, me some okay, of the no, greatest yeah, advice, asked yeah. them how we're here, doing, and that's what I do with my wife all the time. Here, here. Here's where we're dealing with, guys. Very basic. We have a Judeo Christian value country that's been this way forever. We have a, we have a, a devious uh, uh, ideology that's, that's pushed by the Democratic Party that, that the strategy is, is misery. So, no, a lot of these people don't know the, the, the facts I just gave uh, Spencer, unfortunately. And it's not a matter of talking right now. These guys know what they're doing. It's been a long term plan for a long time. They've stolen our history. Now, how many Americans do not know the greatness of the, of the black race who think that we're strictly a hapless race? that came out of slavery and, and found Let the white Let me ask you both the question. So, Obama yeah, is the president. Is the first, the first, it's hang on, not a problem. Hang on. The first black president in American history, historic. 3,900 people murdered in his adopted hometown of Chicago while he's president. You barely heard him ever talk about it. 18,000 shootings in Chicago in the last six years of his That's presidency. Right. Here's my point. On this program, Spencer, I scrolled the names of all those people that we never hear about. Was it wasn't, he commented on Cambridge, he commented on Ferguson, he commented on Trayvon Martin, he commented on Freddie Gray. He never went after what was a, a, a literally a war zone in his own hometown. And he could have done something about it. 
and NFL players can do things as well. I'll support charities. Spencer, you come to me tomorrow and you say, I got a great charity for kids. I'm in. Mm -hmm. Burgess, you tell me. I'm in. I'll help you. And so will a lot of other Americans because we care about those kids and God's potential is in every one of those kids. Sean, what I care about is getting the merit together on this subject and not talking about those historical facts. Although they're facts, they have very little to do with the matter at hand. We need engagement between the dissenters, the people on the right, the people on the left. This is not Honor a political their problem, country by the way. and their flag is, uh, and their no. anthem. In Honor their it. Way. Sean, Sean, can we agree that the experience that we're talking about that everyone should uh, honor is not the same for everyone in America? That is the difficult well, truth. Spencer, We've come Spencer, a long Spencer, way. Right, well, the experience is not the same for everyone in hey America. Guys, hey guys, and I'm telling you, I, I deal with everything, this all the time. Everybody, especially, let me just say something, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what our color is and what our background, it's all about hope. You're right. This country gives us all hope, if you're willing to, to, to tell it. We're now telling our kids that they don't have a chance. As you and I sit here, Well, I don't, I don't know where you're from, but I tell, tell my kids that. So I tell black, my kids that. Well, I we speak to, tell to more hundreds of thousands of kids, of kids we every tell, year. We tell more than your kids. We tell all the other kids. Around the country. Country. Right now, I disagree with what you're saying. The black Listen, what you're articulating is that we're not taking care of again, our guys. community. And I take uh, offense to that. We, we take care of well, our well, community. Let me finish. Are, so why I, let me finish, okay? When do we not take care of those kids in Chicago. Let me finish. We know we're not taking care of those kids. They're not going up in a safe neighborhood. Sean, let me frame this up real quick because I got Steve Sleep. Real quick, last word. Okay, let me frame this up for you. If you remember back in 1964 when New York City was on the world stage, right? Dr. Martin Luther King and a few other folks wanted to, to, to comment about what was taking place or not taking place in their community. They derided him for that peaceful protest. And what he said was really insightful. He said, I wish that you were as offended as the conditions that make it necessary for me to have to engage but in such way, civil disobedience. Republicans he couldn't help even the 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 going and listen, You're not dealing with the issues. About, right, you guys are chasing no, ghosts. I can have policy. you guys on for two hours. Our kids. I, got, I got a letter from Rick here. I know it's getting a little loud. We're all passionate about this. This is not going to go well for the NFL. Remember House Majority Whip Steve Scalise? He was shot on that ball field. He wants to weigh in after Las Vegas on the gun control debate. And two announcements you're going to like straight ahead. Welcome back to Hannity. So in the wake of the mass shooting in Las Vegas, once again, members of the liberal mainstream media have found themselves on Sunday talk shows, predictably pushing for more gun control. Take a look. The bump stock thing might have affected this. A background check might have, might solve it for another particular either mass but shooting or regular shooting. Background no, but I'm saying that's what I'm saying. One law is not going to fix the whole problem. A real gun debate has to look at that fact. The 300 million guns, and um, uh, we need to, you know, look at what was done in a place like Australia where they had a, a gun buyback. Even the NRA accepts that you don't have the right to have an automatic weapon. So what then is the constitutional limit that says, but you are absolutely entitled to have a semi-automatic weapon? This is all kind of made up mumbo jumbo. Even though this is a win that everybody agrees is something that is, should be done, there's some people that are concerned about what that means for the next thing down the line. Would you then go to semi-automatics? Would you then get the background check legislation that Democrats have wanted for a long time? Joining us now is House Majority Whip Steve Scalise, who's still recovering after being shot over the summer. And he's pushing back against the left's efforts to politicize what happened out in Vegas. Joining us now, Louisiana Congressman Steve Scalise. I am so glad to see you. I just want you to know, uh, and this audience's thoughts and prayers were with you, and I tried to relay that to people on your staff. Uh, how are you doing, Congressman? I'm doing great, Sean, and uh, it's great to be back with you. I really appreciate the prayers. Uh, we felt them. We received that uh, from you and for people all around the world. It, it really was uplifting at a tough time for me and my family. And the power of prayer can't be underestimated. Uh, as I said on the House floor, I'm a living example that miracles really do happen because I saw real miracles happen out on that ball field and, and even after that. So uh, it's, I'm lucky to be alive and, and it's just really good to be with you. I remember getting a, an early report like a day, two days after and that you had had a massive number of blood transfusions and it was very touch and go. Have doctors told you how close you were to maybe not recovering from this? They did. Um, you know, 
probably about a month after when I was through all the surgeries, uh, I asked my, my main trauma surgeon, D Dr. Sava, I said, can you walk through with me what really happened, especially in those first few days when I was unconscious. I didn't come to until about the fourth day after I went to the hospital because of all the surgeries. And he said, that first day especially, there were at least two times where it could have gone the other way. And, uh, you know, you look at look at just getting to the hospital alive. My colleague from Ohio, Brad Wenstrup, if he's not there, a doctor, a com an army ranger who, who actually served combat and helped get people to the hospital from the battlefield, he applied a tourniquet that, that slowed the bleeding down and I would have bled out if I, if I didn't uh, have that tourniquet applied. Uh, and I would've, wouldn't have even, even made what it to is the your, hospital, so. What is your recollection of the shooting? Um, I, I remember hearing the first shot but you're not thinking we're playing baseball and you're not thinking there's a there's a gunman shooting we're out on a ball field i looked and i, I saw a tractor where the noise was coming from and i figured maybe the, the the tractor backfired and then all of a sudden you heard a few more shots and by that point i got hit and went down and uh was hearing a lot of gunfire back and forth uh that's when my security detail uh, agents David Bailing, they, they were Reiner, amazing. Engaged the shooter. They're oh, true they, heroes. They all risked their lives. Uh, they were they're in an open field with a pistol against a rifle. And yeah. yeah, they but, were heavily outgunned. But look, if they didn't have those guns to counter the shooter, uh, it would have been a massacre. You know what he went out there intending to do. And if it wasn't for the fact that he was confronted with other people with guns, uh, he would have gotten away with it. And, and luckily for all of us, he didn't. Well, you know, I, it was really heartbreaking last week. I was in Vegas and I interviewed a guy. He was holding his wife of 32 years hand when she got shot in the back of the head and died in his arms. He nearly killed me. I want to play what he said to me. The country races into a big debate over gun control. You lost your wife. When you hear that and then maybe juxtapose it versus what the president said today, what is the right thing for the country to do and how to handle it? Sean, uh, uh, it, was, it, it was a tragedy Sunday night. I, I still will never give up my rights. Still never give up my rights. I will never give up my rights. You were shot in that field that day, and you're saying the same thing. Diane Feinstein said this weekend, I don't think there's any set of laws that could have prevented what happened in Vegas. So what is your answer to all of those that so quickly race to politicize this? Oh, well, first, my prayers are with the families, uh, those people that, uh, that lost loved ones and those people that are still fighting for their lives. And what I said was, in any tragedy, uh, when you have a tragedy, your first thought ought to be, how can we help the people that are, that are suffering, the victims of a criminal act like this? How, you know, let's pray for them, first of all. In a case like what happened in Las Vegas, similar to what happened to me, a lot of those people needed blood. I called immediately for people to go and donate blood. And, and yet, unfortunately, you got some people, their first thought when they hear what happened is to go and hold a press conference and call for more gun control when they don't even know the facts. And frankly, the things that they're offering would have done nothing to stop uh, the, that shooting. And so why don't we, at least in those moments, our, our full thoughts ought to be with, with those victims in praying for them because I felt the prayers. Those prayers helped me. And I would imagine a lot of those families uh, are, are looking for those prayers right now. No, Congressman, we're glad you're well. We're glad you're back. We wish you a full, complete recovery. I know you still got a little ways to go. We're so glad you can come on tonight, and we're glad uh, you survived that. Thank you for being with us. When we come back, two very big announcements. I think you'll like them. Straight ahead. All right, before we go, two big announcements. You know what? I'm so tired of Hollywood. Two years ago, I signed on with Kevin Sorbo and Sam Sorbo, and I'm the executive producer. It's two years in the making, and the movie's called Let There Be Light and it will debut in theaters on Friday, October 27th. I'm really proud of this project. You can bring your whole family. It's not the same formulaic, boring, Harvey Weinstein Hollywood movie. This is different, and I think you'll enjoy it. Here's a clip. The basic tenet of Christianity. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is coach's timeout. Don't you dare tell me about the love and the compassion of your so-called God. Because if he felt like sacrificing his only begotten son, well, that's his business. But he should have bloody well kept his hands off of mine. Yeah! So it'll debut, Let There Be Light. It's going to be in theaters. Its debut is October 27th. My website, Hannity.com, has a list of theaters. Also, big programming note.